when we got back to the church, the commissioner was walking up and down the pavement and we parked and got out. He said, and where do you think you're going? And my husband had already told me, don't stop, just keep going. That afternoon, I was in this church, the Little Union Church. Pastor at that time was Pastor C.C. McClain. We had gathered that Sunday to memorialize. I just got a phone talking to a guy in Birmingham. Uh, four little girls who had lost their life at the 16th Street Baptist Church on a Sunday morning. You know, the little girls got killed in, 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 uh, in Birmingham at 16th Street. But the following week, a memorandum went out across America to the various churches and organizations to come together the next week to memorialize the four little girls. On Sunday, they had a, a, a little memorial at Little Union for the little girls. Here in Shreveport, uh, the NAACP, the SCLC, Pastor Harry Blake, uh, Pastor Harold Bethune, uh, and others put the word out that we would gather at Little Union. Well, that Sunday, we gathered that little union. It wasn't. It, initially, it was going to have a, a outside rally, but they didn't get a permit, so they held the protest inside. The thing that I think disturbs me most about it is, is that they brought out Shreveport, the sanitation department. They brought out their trash trucks. Now, not like our trash trucks of today. These were basically large trucks with wooden uh, rails to hold trash in, and the people that were arrested, and this is a paraphrase but close, uh, they were there to uh, take the prisoners to be hauled off like the trash that they were. So they, they had these little trucks with flat, and they had those lined up around Booker T and around J.S. Clark because they thought that those students were going to get out of hand again. The, you know, the, mo the, the, the objective was to keep, keep, keep the disturbance down by whatever means. There was a conversation going around uh, out here on the streets that Dr. King was in the house. Well, Dr. King was not in the house. Uh, the commissioner uh, approached the church uh, and the people coming in for the service were saying there was police everywhere outside. So Pastor Blake and Pastor uh, McLean and Pastor Rutledge and Pastor Spellman and Pastor John B. Simmons went toward the front to see what was going on. And of course being curious as, as a boy, you know, I went outside to look because I saw all these deputies, you know, but the, I mean, um, I'm traveling, I'm heavy, you know, it's like an arm camp. So I came back to the service and, and stayed. The speaker that night was Mr. Coke, the trustee at 16th Street. He is the one that discovered uh, the bodies of the girls. Since they didn't get a permit to have anything, Guard Toys, you know, and his men invaded that, 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 that memorial. The fire and the police departments were both under the same man. His name was George Dartoys. I got to meet George a couple of times. <laughs> George Dartois was a former Marine, World War II vet, tough as nails, could be charming, weirdly. And he said on multiple occasions that he was hired to come to Shreveport and keep the lid on his term. That's a quote. And he did. He was unfair, very unfair. The officers that he had working, you know, even though they were riding horses, and they would, he would have them to beat, you know, beat you down. He is to what uh, Bull Connor was to Birmingham, he is that for Shreveport, Louisiana. Dark Toys has every policeman in Shreveport out there in 
ride helmets, basically World War II style helmets, ammo belts, truncheons. We had a, a large, uh, relatively large horse unit. They brought them out. They had tear gas. They had riot shotguns. The commissioner of public safety, Mr. Dartos, George Dartos, came in the front door and used the N word, and where is the N? And uh, the word came out, who are you looking for? And he said, you know what we're looking for. You know what I'm looking for. It was filmed by the police because they were trying to show that what they did was good for society. Bad, bad all the way through it. But that's what was, that was their idea. They went in and disturbed the, the rally. I was sitting about the third or fourth floor outside. Came up the steps, all right? Came in the sanctuary and the horses could, could make it. The, the riders had to, being on the back of the horse, bend down to get in the, the front entrance and the doors of the sanctuary. But once they got in, and the next thing he knows, a policeman puts his hand in the back of his collar. They snatched him and they rode him around the church on horseback in here. That's when they drug him out and then took, took him on the side where the a gas meter is and beat him mercifully. I did talk to some of the members of Little Union who says, yeah, it happened because my dad was the custodian and we had to shovel the manure out of the church. He just remembers them reaching for him, and it was kind of a tug of war between a family member who was trying to pull him back in and the police pulling him out. Of course, the police won, and he just remembers everybody getting a piece of his head. The next thing you know, he grabbed a billy club from an officer and hit Pastor Blake. I'm 16 years old. I'm seeing the police hit a preacher. I'm a young preacher in a church. People ran. I was about seven years old, second grade, when Dr. Harry Blake was brutally beat within an inch of his life. I remember how upset my mother, Virginia, was and my grandmother, Nell Kilpatrick, because she was very much into the civil rights movements as well, and how appalled they were at the way that human beings were being treated. Yes. I just thought it was devastating that they would even do that, you know. But, you know, Dartars was a commissioner back then, and he, he, was, he just didn't, he would just do anything to you. Maxine Sarper had just moved to town like a month before. My being a nurse and my husband being a physician, it wasn't, um, we went in seeing uh, as medical professionals. He said, I'm going, I'm Dr. Joseph Sarpy and I'm going into the church I've been called. And so then we could hear people calling for us on the side of the church because that's the way we were going to enter through these steps. So we passed over the commissioner and several uh, others who were with him and went up into the upstairs of the church. They carried him in. He was in the front of it and uh, at least one officer and probably more, um, they beat him with uh, blackjacks, billy clubs, and cracked his skull. And there we saw Reverend Harry on a sofa. Of course, my father's pastor. I didn't go out, so we heard a lot of noise. Deacon Harris came upstairs, an old study on this side of church, and told us that Pastor Blake had been beaten. And of course, you come to the church that though, and, and Pastor Blake looked like a purple rag. All blood was everywhere. And my mother saw him and screamed like I've never heard her scream before. And blood was streaming everywhere, you know, all over him and everything. And they were trying to run to see what they could do to try to help him or to, to take care of him. So my husband ran in, and God works in a mysterious ways, his wonders to perform next door to the church was my husband's office, and he got all of the equipments that he needed. And my husband and I, along with members of the church, escorted us and surrounded us past the commissioner into the church. Mrs. Harvey told me there were three deep lacerations in his forehead. Thus, as he said, the blood 
My mother said you couldn't tell what color his shirt was. After, after Joe saw him, she, he said, we have to get him into the hospital. And at that time, it was only one hospital the where, where black physicians could practice. Members around the church were just uh, so afraid. No, no, Doc, we can't take him into the hospital. The commissioner will go in there and get him, you know? And they sent him to Texas because they were afraid he would be finished off in a local hospital. He could not go to a white hospital. They were terrified. I mean, what was their recourse? He was the public safety commissioner. Whom would they have called? You know, they couldn't call the police. He was the head. There was no chief of police. He was the head of public safety. There's a poignant still photograph. There's a, a young girl who's trying to get away from a mounted horse patrol guy. And you can just see the terror in her face. If there's one image of the bad old days, that should be it. Everybody ought to see that, and they ought to see it multiple times because it describes everything from the black side and it describes everything from the white side. It's like it's um, like I'm there at Little Union again, you know? Like I'm exper experiencing some of the painful things that we experienced during that time. and. Um, I cried a whole lot that night uh, with Reverend Harry, and, I, and there's been many more tears shed since that time in, because of the struggle. Reverend Blake told me bef several months before he died visiting, him, and he said, you know, George and I became friends after that. He apologized to me. He said he was wrong. <laughs> really? <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> he goes, no. He, he said he was doing his job. When I was talking to Karen Pendleton just recently, she mentioned I was talking about door toys and saying, gosh, unbelievable what the African Americans had to endure. She said to me, did you know that door toys had called my father, Dr. Lewis Pendleton, and asked for his forgiveness when he was basically on his deathbed. And I was just blown away. My wake up came in civil rights. I, a young black man selling the paper called the Freeport Sun. Downtown one Saturday went into a store called H.L. Green to get me some water, put my head down in the water fountain, then read no sign to my white only and grabbed it in the back of my neck and was called an end. And, I thought I had been cussed because I had never heard that word. I grew up in Allendale. I grew up around Italians. I grew up around Jews. I grew up around white people. I didn't know that word. I, I, I had an environment that everybody, you know, was concerned about. We played each other, ate each other's mama's food, ate each other's and, and And the sad is sad, when that man called me that, I cried. I, I ran up Texas Street toward First Methodist crying. And the pastor at that time was Dr. D.L. Dykes. And Dr. Dykes said to me, he thought somebody had robbed me from my paper money, and I told him what had happened. And he wiped my face, gave me a hand to him, wiped my face. He said, listen to me. In life, you're going to be called worse things than that word. But remember this, you're God's child. And that's how I live every day. I don't look at you in your color. I look at you in your character. So things still didn't get better in the 80s. Uh, there was a big race riot in Cedar Grove and what local media reports, a black man was killed by a white woman and what was reported as a drug deal gone bad. It was just so heartbreaking, so heartbreaking. Fortunately, nobody killed, you know, people were shooting at people, nobody was killed. The next day, I was, I was there the whole night, and I was so heartbroken, I did not know what to do. And I said to my husband, I'm going to E. Edward Jones Church. And he said, why? And he, I said, because I don't know what else to do. I don't, I don't have a clue what else to do. So my husband and my youngest son was still at home at the time, showed up at E. Edward's Church, which had 1,100 people there. And he said, I know you noticed, I knew him, and he said, to the congregation, I know you noticed three little white faces with us today. And he said, I'd like to welcome y'all here. And, you know, 
say that you're welcome. And Leslie, his wife, came over and sat with us and spoke to us. But it was, that felt healing. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So race is one of those things. Uh, you know, if you want to get into a fight with a bunch of people, you talk about race or politics, that'll do it. You know. But if you, uh, if you keep a, a sane conversation, a logical conversation, and, and again, the more people you know, the more you realize that these factors that are bugaboos, you know, oh, oh, you can't talk about that. Yes, you can. There's nothing you can't talk about if you're polite, if you're civil, and you don't do stupid things. The legacy of enslaved people is still with us, and I think it's I think it's easier to compartmentalize and just to say, well, that didn't happen on my watch. I wasn't responsible for that. That's easy to say, but if you're white as I am and you have white privilege, you benefited from enslaved people's work, and so we all have to acknowledge that. There are so many different agencies and people that do diversity training. I think we ought to do similarity training. I really do. The more you know somebody, the less likely are you uh, you will be not to hate them. It's about communication, and if you don't, if I don't learn from one of my black friends, things like, "Don't touch my hair." <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, you know, we teach each other things, and I'm listening because I don't have all the answers, but if I listen to you and you have a different point of view, I'm going to learn something, especially if I respect you. So I respect my black friends. They respect me. We listen to each other. I became a better man and a better person when I became a better communicator. I think that's what's lacking, uh, communication and morality. Uh, when we look at people's morals and are we able to communicate, are we able to talk? I mean, we, we live in a digital social media age where people um, would rather converse that way than actually have a real conversation and really sit down and talk and get to know, uh, get to know each other. So Stan's record shop was very pivotal during the civil rights movement. It changed the landscape in a way, bringing blacks from the back of the store to the front of the store. Stan's record shop was, was a major uh, record uh, distributor. Uh, they had they had several local distributors with, with I mean record stores, and then they then they distributed records throughout the Southwest. Uh, Stan Lewis was the president, was the owner of that, and Blacks was the major uh, was the major clients or, or the major or the major buyers of his of his product, but they had no black salesmen. All they had was people in the warehouse uh, stocking and, and packing record to be shipped out. And the young, brave children uh, who marched, protested from Booker T to the school board office and how they were uh, instrumental in making things happen downtown at Stan's record shop. And, and the theme was, you know, blacks don't buy what blacks can't sell. And that caught root, and that was a real strong, uh, a real strong uh, movement. Uh, and 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 that, and and finally, after I guess maybe uh, six or eight months, Stan um, hired some uh, some black salespeople in in his stores. One sector of the community felt like we had achieved something. The sector that got hired felt like they got it on their own, and they didn't feel no, 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 no commitment, uh, responsibility of, 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 of helping others achieve things, and that's and that's the and that's where we are now in in in, in Shreveport as well as in, in America where, the stories stop being told. See, African Americans, you know, we had our own little little little, little villages. We 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 our economics and our money floated. Through the community several times before leaving. After integration, that changed. You know, a lot of our businesses left the community, and right now we don't have hardly any businesses except for a funeral home or two that that really generates any revenue of, of any of any size. But but we had stores, we had 
restaurants. I mean, we was really along the Milam Street, Pier Avenue, uh, Fourth Street corridor. I mean, we had we had so many black businesses. Uh, 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 I mean, I mean, just everything that make up a community: uh, filling stations, gas stations, mechanic shops. I mean, just 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 whatever we wanted to have. Uh, integration. Um, allowed a lot of progressive African Americans to move out and they left the community because when I grew up here uh, Dr. Sims he lived right on Looney Street we had um, teachers and everybody was in this particular uh, enclave. The people that helped fight for, for, for integration and for opportunities most of them did not have education mm -hmm. okay but then once people got educated they like I got mine, you know, they got, everybody's got to get theirs. Why can't you be focused on moving up and revitalizing your own neighborhood, okay? So now let's take an example. Uh, South Highlands or the, the Fairfield Historic District. That's an inner city neighborhood. Fairfield Historic District, South Highlands, inner city. But go over there and look at the big mansions right down the street from you all's uh, location. They haven't abandoned their, their neighborhood. They're still there. There's some people probably who live in Southeast Shreveport, but there is a concerted effort to keep their houses nice, lawns manicured. It doesn't matter about the size of the house. Paint your house, manicure your lawn, all of that. But again, that's a, that's a cultural thing. But yes, in many instances, because the premise is about trying to live around European descendants. African descendants have felt that their status is connected to being around white um, individuals. That's what has happened. So from here, uh, we moved to Queensboro. When white uh, residents left Queensboro, they moved to Western Hills. <laughs> African descendants moved to Western Hills. White descendants then moved to um, South Shreveport. They moved to South Shreveport. And, and so I don't blame white folks for saying, well, y'all just build your own neighborhood. It's just, why are you... But what they don't understand, that goes back to slavery. Because they're trying to validate their, themselves through the status of being around them versus building up your own neighborhoods. We are now a majority African-American city who have really no economic base, uh, we've lost jobs, you know, we've lost over 20,000 jobs in the last 15 years, starting with General General Motors and, and General Electric and Lucen and Google Battery, those kind of places. And those jobs have not been replaced. Think about it, the crime only came in because those individuals who used to be in the community moved out and they have not invested, like Bubba said, into the community. So what you think gonna happen? Those individuals who are part of the underworld is now, they're gonna take over that neighborhood. Now you have a people who are spiritually, culturally bankrupt, trying to acquire money, status, and materialism at any and all costs. So I don't see any value in Dominique. If I see you out and you got a nice car, I'm just gonna rob you. I don't care about your children. I just gotta go get it. You gotta now take individuals who are now at a subhuman, savage level and now work to reprogram them. And in order for that to happen, they gotta see it. And the best place to make them see it is, is at these schools. Over the years, organizations have tried to reach the children where they are. Uh, most recently, there was a big fight that happened at a local school that made national news. And it really put a fire under local people to really say, what can we do to change this? We need positivity in this area. Dads on Duty was born. You, we're talking about uncles brothers, mentors, fathers coming together and making sure that that school was safe and had positivity. Now those people who are now in the communities, they can now deal with after school programs and whatnot, but it's a multifaceted approach. Our job is on the prevention side at the school level. We have to look at the infrastructure of the city as well. We cannot talk about um, just as a person deal. We have to look at the amenities that, that, that's placed around the person. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my, my number one goal for the city of Shreveport would be let's turn on the lights. <laughs> let's turn the lights around here. I mean, I'm, I'm driving through Shreveport at night and it's dark. It's dark. We all know that the criminals operate in the dark. You know, and Dr. King said it best. The only thing that can drive out darkness is light. Uh, the poverty level in Shreveport is around 38 percent of our African-American lives on or below that level. Uh, the, medium, the medium income is less than uh, 30,000 household income. So there's so many, there's so many ills uh, that, we, that we've fallen into. And I don't know how, I don't know, I don't see a pathway right now of climbing out of this because again, we was unified at that point in the 60s. And then we, we split off into gated communities and upper scale uh, positions and, uh, and not caring about uh, the least of them anymore. And that's, 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 a, that's a travesty that we, that we're facing. You know, a lot of the ministers helped uh, in that day. We don't have any ministers right now basically that support any, any type of movement or uh, any, any type of response to any incident that happens in the black community. And that's one of the things that are hurting us the worst is that we just don't have advocates uh, that, uh, that look beyond themselves to help the community as a whole. So black history in the 60s looks very different than black history today. Well, 60 years ago, uh, we were what was known in the conversational as a, visit, as a village city. Because if you lived in Allendale, Lakeside, Motown, Stoner Hill, some way, somehow, everybody knew you or they knew your family. If you got in trouble in a part of the city, you, got, you suffer consequences. Well, we don't, have the neighbor, we don't have the village mentality no more. When I was a kid, um, most of the people that was responsible for my knowledge and, and were in my community. You know, um, Dr. Simpkins didn't live too far from where I lived. Um, the pastor of the church that I went to lived in the same neighborhood that I lived in. The people that owned the local grocery store lived in the same neighborhood. So it was more of a community type aspect and people were closer. People actually talked to each other. But we have so many young children, the young girls having babies. And that's the problem. They're kids, kids raising kids. And that's the problem. And they don't want you to say anything to their children, even in the classrooms with the teachers. You know, if uh, the teacher called the parents and said that the child was acting up in school, then they're going to say, no, not my child. He didn't do that. The parents are going to have to let the teachers do their jobs, and they're going to have to do their jobs and discipline their kids. And that's why so many of them are dropping out of school. We have what I see and what I am personally say, we have neighborhoods. We have thugs in our neighborhoods. We have gun violence in our neighborhoods. I promise you, there's a mother right now that wants to save her son, but she does not know how. She doesn't. She's getting up going to work every day. She's trying to raise her other children. This kid has probably lost, hurt, and angry. She probably maybe had him at a young age, or he doesn't have a relationship with his father, or if he does, it's probably a strained relationship. And he's trying to figure life out. And the thing that's welcoming him the most is the streets. That's what's welcoming, because it's easy and it's accessible. You can ride around any major city, even right here in Shreveport, and find a group of guys together, roll up on them and say, I need a piece. All you got to do is have some money. But if she knows she has a place that she can bring him to, and they're going to maybe enroll him in a program, maybe get him a mentor, um, maybe get him to the place that can help him the most. If us as men, whether we're white, we're black, we're Hispanic, Asian, whatever it are, if we can come together and be in one place and these mothers can bring their sons to them and we can start saving them, I guarantee you that would change a lot of stuff, meaning like having Goodwill's there, Goodwill Industries there that's going to be hiring people. Maybe a Roy Griggs who owns 20-something McDonald's can be there and say, well, look, I got a job for you, young men, and I want to put you through a training program before you go to work. I mean, having these all these men in a room together willing to save our young men that's what's gonna save them. We can't wait on SPD because that's not their job. Um, their job is to police. 
Uh, we can't wait on a, the, the governor to send in the National Guard or whatever. Would Booker T. Washington, would Dr. Martin Luther King, of course they wouldn't be pleased with this Not crime at all. that the African-American community Not with these boys. All. What does that do to the black dream, the, the black history? Well, if you compare it to an automobile, it's a hell of a fender bender, you know? It doesn't do anybody any good. Look at the harm it does to the families of the victims and the neighbors. And look at the harm it does for the city. And look at the harm it does for the family of the perpetrator. But again, my mother really didn't see people in terms of color, okay? And there are other factors involved here. It's not just black on black. We're killing each other. There's socioeconomic factors. There's political factors. There's people who have not had parents for, what, two, three, four generations now who have not had father figures. It's a very complex uh, problem. The resources are here. The resources are here. It's just the resources are not getting to the people that need them the most. That's what's happening. We don't have a certain place to take a certain kid at a certain time. There are steps that have to be taken. I think that process needs to be shortened up a whole lot. And parents need a safe place to take their kids and say, listen, I don't want my son, I'm not turning my son over to the police, but I know he's doing some things that he shouldn't. Who can I reach out to? There are parents that are gonna watch this interview that are gonna see me say that and say, I'm dealing with that. How can I help my son? What resources are available to my child? And I know that he's gonna get the help that he needs. Well, by December of 2021, Shreveport had reached 86 homicides. We had not seen those numbers since the 90s, numbers like that. And some people think that instead of progressing, we're actually regressing, partly because most of those homicides involved black people killing other black people. Shreveport is my home. I love my city and, and, I, and it hurts me to, to see the crime, the violence. Lady lost her life right over there in Queensburg. Uh, I don't care what her lifestyle was. She was an individual. But we're in a state now in America where we don't talk no more. We don't discuss things no more. But if one of them has a gun, the gun is empowerment. And if you are empowered, if you have power, you're more likely to use it if you're mad. So, you know, the common answer is educate them, deconflict, deconflict, but in this case, the way I'm using it, deconflict, remove that conflict. Uh, as long as, as guns are, are cheap, you're going to have this problem. Growing up in this city, if I got into a fight today, I lost the fight. But tomorrow, the person I had a fight with, we still, we, we're still friends. Now you have a fight. Instead of the fight being negated and over with, the person that get beat go home and get grandmama and Uncle Bubba and ain't, and ain't Sally, and along with their nine millimeter or their Glock, and they come back and solve the problem. That's, that, that, does, that does not solve the situation. It's hurt. It's hurt. You, you, you're dealing with people who are mentally hurt, mentally frustrated. You, you may be dealing with a mother who um, had a child and had a child by a person that maybe didn't want to be a father or maybe both parents were young and didn't understand what it took to really raise a child. And when we had those children, they didn't come with a big old book that said, if you do everything in this book, you'll be a great parent. It doesn't work like that and not having a support system. And that young mother may have dealt with postpartum depression. And that child may have been a victim of that depression. And they grow up with hurt and anger. And now they're hurt and they're angry and they don't understand what's going on. But if we can start removing some of those stigmas and understand that we need help. When, when, when I first, in our, in our med management program, one of the things that we explain to parents is that your body is made up of a bunch of chemicals, a bunch of them. and when a chemical is missing, that's called a chemical imbalance, we may need to reintroduce that chemical back into your body. If you have a headache, it's an aspirin or a Tylenol that takes care of that. That's the chemical that's missing out of your body. We're gonna reintroduce it and then the headache goes away. It's the same thing with psychotropic meds. 
something's missing, we're going to add it back in to balance you out and make sure you can function throughout your day. And I think if more people looked at it like that, and I'm not just trying to say, hey, let's medicate everybody. It doesn't always have to be medication. It could be exercise. It could be nutrition. Mm -hmm. Most young kids, when they don't get the nutrition that they need, their brains doesn't, they don't develop properly. And when they don't have proper brain development, then it doesn't, that means that they're not cognitive, th cognitively thinking. And when they don't cognitively think properly, then they make bad decisions. And those bad decisions lead to another bad decision, then another bad decision. Mm -hmm. And then they're labeled. And once they get the label, they can't get the label off. And now I have a felony, and now I can't get a job, and now I just have to go into survivor mode. So it leads into an onslaught of things that continue. I was one of those people who had said I wasn't coming back. But when I did come back in 1995, I really fell in love with the city once I came to know about the politics. So it's gonna take people who are natives coming back and, and reinvesting and putting up their money where their mouth is. I tell people all the time, when I got out of the Air Force, I could have went anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll ship you wherever you want to go, whatever your home of record is. And I chose Shreveport on purpose. I chose Shreveport because Shreveport had given me so much. We say a word tough, I say resilient. Uh, I don't I don't look at the people in my neighborhood as, as tough. I look at them as being resilient. These are These are people who overcame any and every obstacle that was ever put in that place uh, to not only uh, build schools and bring education, uh, but to bring grocery stores, but to um, bring everything that was needed. Uh, you got to remember when that neighborhood was first started, uh, you know, they had their own fire station, their own water treatment plant. I mean, everything. Um, they became valuable, so valuable that the city of Shreveport was like, we got to annex them in. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, but the, the value of not just the neighborhood, but the people that live in the neighborhood. And that's where my values came from. So Shreveport has been a paradox in a way, you know, we've had good times and we have bad times. I can see progress. I can see a lot of progress. I would not say we're in the best place, but we have the potential to be in a great place. And when we talk about potential, Shreveport has always been full of potential. There are young leaders each and every day that are being born and right here in this city. There are young leaders each and every day that are getting up going to school and doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. We sometimes look at the negative, but I want to focus more on the positive. I want to think about those young people that are aspiring every day, that are filling out college applications, that are, that are uh, waking up extra early to prepare themselves. You look at a young man like a Tredavious White, um, you look at a, 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 a Andreas Williams, you look at a Rodarius Williams, and I'm not just talking about from an athlete perspective. You look at another um, a uh, young person who was just from my neighborhood that went to see Bird that was just uh, uh, on, on the Emmy Awards. So you look at the leaders that are here and people that we see and then we talk about the everyday people um, that are that are making waves um, and, and doing things each and every day to aspire and inspire. So there are leaders here. Um, we have to make sure that we promote them. We have to make sure that um, we enlighten them, but most importantly, we gotta make sure that we protect them and give them safe spaces to be leaders. I think it's a clock that goes backwards and forwards because when Barack Obama was elected, I would have told you that clock has progressed a lot farther than I thought it was possible to progress at that time, and yet it's gone backwards since then. So I don't know where it is right now. I think it's, I think it's still going backwards at the moment, but I know that what was it, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. I know that it will swing back again, and I just hope I'm alive to see it. In continuing to tell the black history story, Dr. Gary Joyner has created this civil rights trail that he's been working on for three years. It really documents every part of black history in the Shreveport and Bossier area, from lynchings and even the landmarks that we're talking about today. I think it's Im too important not to and that at a certain point, I mean, as a kid, I lived through it in rural Union Parish, and I saw, you know, that side of things. But, you know, as time goes on, as, as we grow older, the number of people that we can talk to is dwindling. The Pete Harris Cafe was the A&P grocery store. When Pete got that building, he did it because of all of, you know, all of those things. I've got, I'm working on a pretty good timeline on it. Why are you digging up old wounds? That's the most common one. And my answer is, 
so we can understand. It, it's, it, it has to be done. If, if not us, who? And if not when, now has to be it. It has to be. Write it in the sky and all the world will never be the same. Stepping into my power across the sands of time. In my darkest hour, elevate my mind. Oh, don't forget about me. No, 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 no. Don't forget about me. Overflow